in this uh, session we are going to uh, talk about uh, what is probability and what are the different kinds of applications of probability to the world of risk management so initially uh, we would be uh, trying to cover upon a discrete random variable versus continuous random variable how do we really uh, differentiate between the two what are the different kinds of properties that are associated with each one of them what do we uh, call as the probability uh, density function pdf function and accumulative distribution function cdf so how does the, how do those uh, things apply for uh, a discrete variable versus a continuous variable so that's one aspect then what do we really uh, mean by inverse cdf inverse cumulative distribution function right uh, how do i derive inverse cumulative distribution function then we'll go ahead trying to understand different kinds of events where we'll be talking about mutually exclusive events then we'll also uh, cover up on independent events how do we uh, differentiate or what is the conceptual difference that is existing between each of these different kinds of events then we'll go ahead try to understand what is a probability matrix and towards the end we'll try to understand what do we mean by conditional probability so in this session this is what is the scope that we are going to touch base upon all right so let's get uh, started one by one now what is this discrete random variable so discrete what is this discrete random variable now first thing we need to understand the fact that anything to do with the probability it's very very interesting it's very much essential in the world of risk management so we will find variables which are two types one is the discrete the other is the continuous so any variable which can take countable number of observations countable number of outcomes so when i'm tossing a coin i'll get only either a head or a tail only few set of outcomes right or i look at a particular kind of a bond there are only a few credit ratings associated with it either it could be a triple a or a double a or a triple b or some such kind of a credit rating so where there are countable number of outcomes so each outcome has some kind of chance of occurring so that is what we are associating the probability of that particular event occurring so i'll say a probability that a particular random variable x takes a value xi so here it means probability that a particular bond b1 takes a credit rating of triple a is some pi some probability let's say 5% 0.05 so it means there is a 5% chance that this particular bond the credit rating of this particular bond which is a random variable is taking a triple a rating right so this is how we express the probability the chance that a random variable x takes a value xi is pi so xi could be x1 x2 x3 so on so this is the probability of occurrence for a discrete random variable 
And here, a few important things that I have to uh, understand is, if I sum up all these probabilities for all the different possible occurrence of the values, for also like probability of getting a head plus probability of getting a tail. So because these are the only two kinds of outcomes possible. Probability of getting a triple A, probability of getting a double A, probability of getting a triple B, all these probabilities, if I sum up, it should be equal to one. So the probability of any event occurring, not any single event, if I'm looking at at least one event occurring, the probability of it should be equal to one. So in a notation form, we can very well write this way for a discrete random variable. So any variable which can take a countable number of outcomes is what we are calling as a discrete random variable. All right. So then what is continuous random variable? Now, instead of taking a few limited set of values, I'll say a continuous random variable will take any value, literally any value, within a given range. So probably I can say it can take any value between 0 and 1. Or it can take any value greater than 0, means 0 to plus infinite. Or it can take any value from minus infinite to plus infinite. Whatever is the range. Here the range is not important, but within that particular range, it literally any value is possible. Look at the kind of uh, returns that you can take on a stock index. This is are probably a stock price. Stock returns, index returns, they are all continuous random variable. Right? Because return generally is greater than minus 100%. But it can go to literally any positive infinite. So it could be as good as saying it lies in the interval minus 1 to infinite. So when I am talking about a continuous random variable, here the range could be a finite range. Right? I can still say the value lying between 0 and 1. So the range could be a finite range. But the number of values that can literally come up within that particular range should be more or less infinite. Which means the probability that X takes some specific value, here there are not unlimited number of, uh, here there are unlimited number of values. So the probability that X is equal to some specific value will be zero. Because there are, uh, uh, there are almost uh, infinite number of possibilities. So the probability of one occurring out of that infinite is one by infinite, which is equivalent to zero. So generally in case of continuous random variables, we always talk about the probability within a certain range only. Right? We don't talk about uh, the probability of a specific value. The probability of a particular interval occurring, right? Value occurring within a particular interval. I can say what is the probability that the return lies between minus 3% to minus 4%. Within this, there could be a vague number of values. But here we only talk about this kind of intervals, right? So we say probability that R1 less than x less than r2 means the probability that the stock returns lie between r1 and r2 is some p whereas in case of discrete we directly say probability of x equal to xi is pi that's the kind of a differentiation here it is exactly equivalent to a particular value in case of discrete Whereas in case of continuous, it can take the value only within a specific range. Then we move towards what is called as a probability density function. 
generally very much applicable for a continuous random variable right because the probability of a specific event occurring is very much close to zero but what we can very well talk about is within the intervals also the probability that a specific interval occurs will differ from the probability of some other interval occurring so it is like probability that the return will be between 1 to 2 percent could be different from probability that the return will be between 2 to 3 percent right so i need to clearly have some kind of a representative function which can which can showcase the behavior of probability for that particular set of observations or for that particular random variable so that is the reason we are defining a probability density function which probably talks about the likelihood of the outcomes so it directly says what is the likelihood that the outcomes can occur between any two particular point what is the likelihood of the outcomes occurring between any two points so that is what we are defining as the probability density function which we generally denote as f of x so typically we have already defined that the probability of x lying between r1 and r2 is p now this is what can get translated into a density function in this way okay integrate between r1 and r2 sum f of x dx this is what should be giving me my probability p so the likelihood so this is what we are calling as the density function so i integrate the density function within the limits i get the probability of occurrence within that specific limit so this is what we are calling as the probability density function similarly people also use a term probability distribution function as well and in short both of them actually work out to pdf pdf is a is a kind of uh, abbreviation that is typically being used so this is how the probability density function gets denoted right uh, the integration of that density function within a particular range will tell me what is the probability of uh, uh, the continuous random variable taking values within that specific range and uh, just like in a discrete case we had the rule saying sum of all the probabilities should be equal to 1 here also i integrate i integrate uh, the probability density function across the entire interval typically minus infinite to plus infinite or a better way of writing is the minimum value of r to the maximum value of r right so whichever is the minimum to the maximum if i integrate my density uh, function the integration should be equal to one so if i know my lower boundary and upper boundary then i'll take those values if i'm not sure about them it's as good as minus infinite to plus infinite so let's look at one sample uh, example which can uh, help us to understand the probability density function and things like that so let's assume uh, a zero coupon bond right i'm taking a zero coupon bond which is having some notional value of ten dollars i am taking the probability density function of this as x by 50 where x is lying between zero and ten so this is the probability density function that i am taking so first of all let me check whether this is a probability density function is it a, a legitimate probability function or not how do i know whether this is a legitimate probability function or not i integrate it 
within the entire limit. So I could integrate it between minus infinite to plus infinite. But because I know that the range of this variable is between 0 and 10, I can integrate this f of x in this particular interval. So just trying to reiterate, okay, I'm taking 1 by 50 out. The integration of x is x squared by 2. I am integrating it between 10 and 0. So I'm getting it as 1 by 50 times. 10 squared by 200 by 250 minus 0 squared by 20. It's coming out to 1, which means this is a legitimate probability function. So I have integrated the probability density function from minimum to maximum. So which is telling me that the total integration value is equal to 1, which is a clear indication that this is a legitimate probability function. Now, I may, be, I, I may be interested in finding out what is the probability that this particular value lies between 8 and $9. What is the probability that x lies between 8 and $9? If that's the case, what is that I'm looking at? I'm simply trying to integrate it between 8 and 9. Right, I'm trying to integrate it between 8 and 9. Now I know this is the integrated value, 1 by 50 times. So probably it's like I have an 8 and 9 here, 9 squared by 2, 81 by 2, minus 8 squared by 2, 64 by 2. So it comes out as 1 by 50 times 17 by 2, which is 17 by 100 or 17%. So there is a 17% chance that the probability will lie between 8 and 9, right? So the uh, so uh, this is what uh, we can very well uh, compute with respect to the probability density uh, function and uh, try to uh, find out what is the probability of uh, a value occurring within a particular interval. Then extending the concept a little bit deeper, we will get into cumulative distribution function, which is otherwise in short called as CDF, which is more and more closely related to the probability density function as well. So it is primarily used to identify what is the probability that a particular random variable is less than a certain value. What is the probability that a particular random variable takes up values which are less than a particular value? So from minimum value to that particular value. So when I'm saying f of x, so it is denoted by the capital F. When I'm saying capital X, what is the probability that the random variable X will take any value from the minimum most value to this value X? So it's as good as saying I am integrating it between the minimum value, let's say minus infinite or probably I'll take the minimum value up to a particular A. So then I'm calling it as F of A. What is that the same? f of x dx is what I am integrating, but I am integrating it from the minimum most value, not within a particular range. I am integrating right from the minimum most value to the value that I typically require. So I am integrating the probability density function from its lower bound up to that particular value. And this is how I denote the cumulative density distribution function. So basically, it's like where any kind of a probability density function, if I'm doing a graph of that, the total area under the graph is 1, which we already know, right? Which is as good as saying integrating it over the entire area, the probability density function, I get a value 1, which means the area under the total probability density function is equal to 1. But when I have to look at the CDF, I'm looking at the area to the left. 
the area to the left of A under this probability density function is what is coming out as the cumulative distribution function. And coming to a few important properties, the cumulative distribution function will always lie between 0 and 1 and it is a never decreasing function. Either it should increase or it should stay flat. So at the minimum most value, we see that CDF will be 0 because there is no other probability that is the, there is no probability of occurrence of a value which is below that minimum value. And at the maximum value, the CDF will be equal to 1 because beyond that, I don't find any kind of probability of occurrence of any value above that maximum value. So we will find CDF is 0 at the minimum most value and it is 1 at the maximum most value. And it is never decreasing because the probability of occurrence of any particular interval is never negative. Because the probability is never negative, the cumulative distribution function cannot be a decreasing function at all. So some of the things that we really need to be comfortable with. Then, once I have a PDF, we have shown how do we get the CDF. We said you integrate it from the minimum value to that particular value probability density function will get the CDF. But if I have the CDF and if I have to convert it into a PDF, I'm doing the reversal of it. So I take the derivative of the uh, CDF, the first derivative of the CDF, which will give me the PDF. Right? Now, another interesting aspect. Okay, let me say f of a. It is nothing but minus infinite to a f of x dx. Similarly, I want to find f of b. It is nothing but minus infinite to b f of x dx. But if I subtract these two, f of b minus f of a, right? So this value minus this value which is going to give me nothing but integral between a and b f of x dx, which is nothing but the probability that a random variable takes the values between a and b, right? So the probability, if I really want to find the probability between two values, it's as good as I take the cumulative distribution functions with respect to those two values and do a subtraction. Similarly, what is the probability that x is greater than a? We know that cumulative distribution is nothing but probability of x less than a, which is f of a, which is minus infinite to a f of x dx. So if I want f of x greater than a, we know that the total probability is 1, so I can very well write it as 1 minus of f of a. 1 minus of f of a is the probability that x is greater than a. So which means using the cumulative distribution function, I can find what is the probability that x lies between a and b which I can write it as f of b minus f of a. I can also find what is the probability that x is greater than a, which can be written as 1 minus of f of a. So these kind of notations also we really need to be comfortable with. Now, if I have to go ahead and find the cumulative distribution function for the earlier example that we have taken, where the PDF was x by 50, where it was lying, x was lying in the interval of 0 to 10. Now let's try finding out the CDF, so which means I'll try to integrate it between 0 to x, 
f of a d a. So that is what we are doing. So 0 to x a by 50 d a. Now I know it is nothing but 1 by 50 times a squared by 2 x and 0. So obviously I am getting it as x squared by 100. The CDF is coming out as x squared by 100. Now, which means I can very well uh, find out what is the probability that the value lies between 8 and 9. We know it is nothing but f of 9 minus f of 8. So f of 9 is 81 by 100, x squared by 100 minus f of 8 is 64 by 100, 17 by 100, which is 17% which we have got earlier. So once I know that this is my CDF, probably I can do the graphing of this CDF. I can very well find out the probability of x taking a value between two, uh, x taking a, a value in a particular interval, all the kinds of calculations I can comfortably do. So that's how we'll go ahead with the cumulative distribution function. Then we have another important concept called inverse cumulative distribution function. In uh, some cases, even this is very much useful. Right, I really want to get a hold of, so it's basically like this. If I'm seeing that f of a is some p, right? What is the, the cumulative distribution function is, let's say, some p. Now it means for what value of a, I get the probability uh, of this much. So, which is nothing but A is nothing but F inverse of P, right? So, it is like for what value of A, the probability is 1%. For what value of A, the probability is 5%. So, that is where we are actually uh, bringing in the inverse CDF, right? So A is coming out as F inverse of P, where P is lying between 0 and 1 because it's a probability. Now, of course, when we understand the distributions, we will appreciate this concept of uh, inverse CDF more effectively. So for some kind of distributions, we see that the inverse CDF is very simple. Whereas for some uh, of them, I can't really find out explicitly the inverse CDF function. I may have to use some kind of simulations for determining the values. So that's one more thing. Now, similarly, in our earlier example, we have got f of a is nothing but a squared by 100 as the PDF, as the CDF. Now, from here, I can very well uh, find out so if I say f of a is p, from here I can very well uh, find out what is a. So a squared is 100 p and then a is 10 into square root of p. So if I want a particular probability, right, uh, if I really want, if p is 0, then a is 0. If p has to be 1, then A has to be 10. So I get the minimum and the maximum values of the distribution. And similarly, let's say if P is 25%, uh, 0.25, then A is 10 times square root of 0.25 is 0.5. So 10 times 0.5 is 5. So like that, we can clear. So for what, for what value of A, the probability the probability of uh, the CDF value will be 50%, right? So, so that is our probably uh, for determining what is called as a median, this could become more and more helpful. We'll look at these things uh, in our later sessions. Then, 
The next topic that we are getting in is understanding a few important types of events where I am bringing in mutually exclusive events. Simple thing, when one event occurs, the other is not going to occur. Those are the mutually exclusive events. So the probability that either of the event occurs, assuming A and B are mutually exclusive, is nothing but the sum of their individual probabilities of occurrence. The probability that either of the values is going to occur is equal to the sum of their individual probabilities. And this logic is true only if they are mutually exclusive. And if they are not mutually exclusive, the probability of any of them occurring is nothing but the probability, the sum of individual probabilities minus the probability of their combined occurrence. Right? So for mutual occurrence, mutually exclusive, this part is zero. They don't uh, occur together. If one occurs, the other is not occurring. So this part is zero in case of mutually exclusive event. So that's the reason for mutually exclusive event, the probability of any one event occurring is simply the summation of the individual probabilities. So I can very well extend the concept of mutually exclusive to any number of events. So if there are n different mutually exclusive events, then I can very well say the probability of any one of those event occurring is simply the summation of the probabilities of each of the individual event. So we can really uh, have the real world example, right? I say the probability that on a particular day, the return will be less than minus 5% on a stock is let's say 2%. And the probability that the return is greater than plus 5% is around 0 0.03. Then I can say the probability of extreme moves going less than minus 5 or greater than plus 5 is simply 2% plus 3%, which is 5%. Because these two are mutually exclusive events. If a minus 5% occurs, then you can't have a greater than 5% and vice versa. They are non-overlapping. They are mutually exclusive. So the probability of any of the event occurring is simply the summation of their individual probabilities. Now, the other kind of a concept that we really need to be comfortable in this context is independent events. Now, another important area to talk about. Just when we talked about the mutually exclusive events, I have brought in one random variable, which is the returns, and two different possibilities, right, for that particular event. Then we call as mutually exclusive. But in some cases, I may be interested in dealing with two or more random variables simultaneously. Now, it is like this. So, what is the probability that it rains tomorrow? Right? What is the probability that it rains tomorrow and the return is greater than 5%? Two different random variables. One, raining tomorrow. Two, the stock return greater than 5%. Now, the most important thing is, is there any kind of influence of one on the other? Will the rain influence my stock returns or not? That's a very crucial point to understand here. If they influence, we call these two random variables as dependent events. And if it doesn't influence, then we are calling these two events as independent events. If rain based on the rain if the stock returns are changing then they are dependent events 
if they are not changing the outcome of the random variable is not changing because of the occurrence of the other one then we call them as independent events so whether the rain occurs or not the probability will remain the same for a stock price going up more than 5% in case of independent event otherwise there could be a kind of an influence so all we are saying is if they are independent probability of a rain occurring and which is denoted by intersection probability of market uh, return greater than 5%. This should be individually the probabilities of each of them. The probability of a rain occurring multiplied by the probability of the return greater than 5%. In case there is no kind of dependence between these two events. And this is what we call as joint probability. The probability of occurrence of two or more events together is what we call as the joint probability. The joint probability will be equal to the product of the individual probabilities if the events are independent. Right? Now, we will also talk about probability matrices. So when we are talking about uh, the joint probability of two variables, so we come across different probabilities. We come across different probabilities. It's better that we represent all these different probabilities in the form of a matrix or in the form of a table. Right? Probably I can uh, talk about, let's say, uh, rain example itself. Okay, rain, no rain. Then market, the, the returns going above 5%, returns going below minus 5%, returns lying between minus 5 to plus 5%. So we have some such kind of possibilities. So we can represent what is the probability of this, probability of this, probability of this, each of these cases. And this is what we are calling as the probability matrix. And if I have to, so it is like probability of rain occurring and the return greater than 5%. This is the number. Probability of rain occurring and the return below between minus 5 to plus 5%. This is the number. Probability of rain occurring and the return less than minus 5%. This is the case. Now, if I add up all these three, this is what will give me the probability of rain occurring. And if I add up all these three, I'll get the probability of no rain occurring. And this will, these two add up will give me probability of the return greater than 5%. Like this, if I add these two, I get the probability that the return is less than minus 5%. These are called as unconditional probability. Irrespective of whatever happens to the other event, this is the probability that the return will be greater than 5%. This is split between these two items, one being if rain occurs, the other being if rain is not occurring. But otherwise, this is the unconditional probability. So unconditional probabilities are simply a uh, coming up by adding across the row or down the column. And one more important point is when I make this kind of a probability matrix, the sum of all the probabilities within that matrix should be equal to 1. So these are some of the interesting uh, things that we can very well bring up as a part of our understanding of the probability matrix. And then Moving to the next important uh, concept in this context, which is the conditional probability. Whenever we are talking about independence, 
there is some level of understanding of the conditional probability that is required. What is the probability that the return is greater than 5% given, given is represented by a vertical line, given that it has rained. It will rain tomorrow. This is what we are calling as the conditional probability. Given the event B has occurred, I am trying to find out what is the probability of occurrence of A. Which means here we have an additional information about the event B. That it has already occurred. And I am interested in finding out what is the probability of the event A occurring. Right? So this is what we are calling as the conditional probability. So if I have to really find that out, based on that information, if I have to uh, find out the probability of both the events occurring. What I am saying, probability of A occurring and probability of B occurring given A has already occurred. Similarly, the other way I can also talk about probability of both A and B occurring, probability of B occurring multiplied by probability of A occurring given that B has already occurred. So, this is what we are linking the conditional probability to the joint probability. So, this is what we are calling as the conditional probability and this is what we are calling as the joint probability of occurrence of a particular uh, set of events. And uh, we will uh, use this kind of relationship, these two things very heavily in what we call as the Bayesian analysis. We'll talk about the Bayes theorem. So, a very important concept in Bayesian analysis. Right? So, this is the kind of a mathematical equivalent that is existing between these two events. And the other important aspect is we can use this conditional probabilities to compute the unconditional as well. Now, let's look at this. The probability of return greater than 5%. Now, what are the, uh, if I really look at, this is same as, remember the probability matrix. Probability of return greater than 5% given that there is a rain. And I can also say probability of return greater than 5% given that there is no rain. So, this is expressed as a summation of two different probabilities. Right? From that uh, uh, probability matrix. Probability of return greater than 5%. So, probability of a, if I want to find out, it is nothing but probability of A given B has occurred plus probability of A given B has not occurred. Right? So, this is what we are uh, expressing an unconditional probability in terms of the conditional probabilities. Probability of A given B has occurred probability of B given A has occurred, uh, A given B has not occurred. So, on any given day, uh, either B can occur or B may not occur. So, the probability of, what is the probability that B will occur? Now, what is that we are saying? Okay, probability of B occurring times probability of A occurring when B occurs, probability of B not occurring times probability of A occurring when B is not occurring. So, this is how we can very well express the unconditional probabilities over with respect to the conditional probability. So, it's always like probability of A occurring is 
सेम एज प्रॉबिलिटी ऑफ ए गिवन बी अकर्स मल्टीप्लाइड बाय द प्रॉबिलिटी ऑफ बी वर्सेस प्रॉबिलिटी ऑफ ए गिवन बी नॉट अकरिंग मल्टीप्लाइड बाय प्रॉबिलिटी ऑफ बी नॉट अकरिंग नाउ द सिंपलर वे टू अंडरस्टैंड इज इफ b1 b2 b3 so on bn they are mutually exclusive and exhaustive events then we are simply saying probability of some other event a occurring is same as i express with respect to each one of them probability of a given b1 has occurred multiplied by probability of b1 plus probability of a given b2 has occurred multiplied by probability of b2 plus and so on now here the rule is b1 b2 b3 so on should be mutually exclusive events and they have to be exhaustive the probability of uh, Uh, or any of the event occurring should be equal to one. Then I can very well express the probability of A in terms of all the others at, uh, in this form of conditional probability. And this is what we are calling as the total probability rule. Then, if A and B are independent. we have already said probability of a intersection b is nothing but probability of a times probability of b but in other cases we have said probability of a intersection b is nothing but probability of a times probability of b given a has occurred now you could clearly see if these two events are independent i can say that these two should be equal which means probability of b should be same as probability of b given a because whether a occurs or not the probability of b occurring is not getting influenced so when two events are independent this is the kind of relationship that exhibits with respect to the conditional probability similarly i can have probability of event a occurring is same as probability of a given b so this is one more important uh, uh, relationship that we can bring in with respect to the conditional probability with respect to the independent events so these are some of the interesting uh, aspects with respect to probability which we really need to be comfortable with before we go ahead and try to implement it in the world of risk management all right thanks a lot for listening to this uh, session thank you very much